It's not like a domestic homicide where there's a smoking gun or a dripping knife. The man was dead. Was it murder? They can smell a carcass from over a mile and a half away that you and I can't even smell yet, and we could be standing 10 feet from it. No one had seen him, but there was a silent witness who would tell a gruesome tale. This kind of investigation is a classic whodunit. Enter the world of forensic science, the science of crime, where a suspect's guilt or innocence can hang on a single piece of evidence. Exhibit A, a fly. Those pesky critters can be amazingly helpful when it comes to solving a murder where there is no confession and no eyewitness, at least not a human one. A dead body is found in the woods. The soft tissue around the eyes, nose, and mouth is swarming with bugs. Half his face and upper torso have been eaten away. There is no ID on or near the body. No way of identifying who he is, how he died, how many days he's been here, or how he's ended up two hours outside of Toronto in the middle of nowhere. With any unexplained death, homicide is brought in. This one seems suspicious. There's not obvious signs of it being a murder. You know, there's not a smoking gun at the scene. Um, in this particular case, though, just the circumstances, you've got a man clad only in his underwear in a wooded area um, with decomposition to his upper, um, upper torso, um, mainly the neck and, and upwards. That itself sets off some warning bells. Police send for a forensic entomologist a specialist who collects and examines the flies and maggots found on dead bodies. Entomologist Neil Haskell is fond of saying, if it dies, they will come, meaning that blowflies will zone in on a dead body instantly. The ability to find a dead thing, to smell it, track up wind, and then find it, is very powerful in the blowflies. Uh, they can smell a carcass from over a mile and a half away that you and I can't even smell yet, and we could be standing 10 feet from it. Neil Haskell should know. Haskell still lives on the same farm where he grew up. As a child, he became fascinated by the process of decomposition in dead livestock on his farm. Today, this childhood fascination has become his livelihood as a forensic entomologist. He scatters dead pig carcasses on various parts of the farm and observes how the insects colonize the decaying flesh. Haskell we uses to, uh, pigs for experiments animals, would, um, because their body mass uh, approximates that of humans. Size. As a result, his observations can be accurately applied to his forensic work on dead humans. It's hoped with Haskell's scientific expertise that investigators will learn about the time of death from the maggots found on the victim's body. But it would be a long process. I did not find an anatomical cause of death. But what I found is consistent with manual strangulation resulting in asphyxia. That statement is based on the fact that the hyoid bone was broken. Pressure on the neck on both sides might fracture the bone. The unknown man had been strangled. But why, when, and by whom? Investigators were to get three big breaks in this case. Fingerprints would be the first. One of the things that the maggots hadn't eaten away were the dead man's fingers. So the IDENT unit 
is able to take prints from the corpse. In Canada, anyone who's been fingerprinted is entered into a national database known as APHIS, or Automated Fingerprint Identification System. The dead man's prints were scanned onto the system. The APHIS database recognizes the minute characteristics which make up our unique fingerprint patterns. In APHIS, if somebody is on that system, if we're comparing a print of somebody who's previously been loaded onto that system, then we will get a hit. Police got lucky. They got a hit. They matched the dead man's prints with those of a man picked up out west for shoplifting. Had our deceased never had contact with any police agency and his prints were not on APHIS, it would have been a longer procedure. Um, it might have taken weeks, it might have taken months before we actually established the identity of, of the deceased. His name was Mikhail Slotnik. Investigators recently learned that he was a Russian pilot who had been sponsored by a church group and placed on a farm out west. According to the couple who owned the farm, Mikhail was a hard worker with an easygoing nature who never complained. He stayed for a year, then set out for the nearby city of Edmonton. In the last letter the couple had gotten from him, they could tell that going to the city had been a big mistake. Isolated by language, Mikhail was lonely, plus he couldn't get a job. But none of this explained how Mikhail had ended up murdered in the middle of nowhere, half a continent away. Now that investigators knew the name of the deceased, they were able to run a search through databases and find Mikhail's bank account. From the information we obtained from bank records, um, that led us to an address in Hamilton. Hamilton, Ontario is a steel town an hour from Toronto, about three hours from where Mikhail's body was found. We sent a team of investigators from our homicide office out to Hamilton to track down this address and to, at that point, try to uh, get more information on the deceased. The person living at the address on the bank records was Vladimir Yelman, Mikhail's friend and countryman. He was surprised to hear of Mikhail's death. Yelman explained that he'd met Mikhail in an Italian refugee camp while they were waiting to come to Canada. He lost track of him when he was sponsored by the farm couple out west. When Mikhail decided to come east and try his luck, Yelman invited him to move in. Together with another Russian pilot, Nikolai Andropov, the three became tight pals. But after getting a part-time job as a welder, Mikhail wanted his own place and moved out. It had been two weeks since Yelman had seen Mikhail. He had come over with a brand new car, a top-of-the-line Acura. Mikhail told Yelman his luck had changed and he was heading down to Florida for a month. Maybe two, maybe forever. Yelman didn't know why he was leaving, nor where he had got the money for the new car. From Yelman, investigators got Mikhail's last address, a third floor flat above a store. The landlord told detectives that he liked Mikhail and that he had lent him money after he recently lost his welding job. But two weeks ago, Mikhail paid back his debt in full. When investigators searched the apartment, they found it a mess, even though the landlord said Mikhail was neat and organized. Their conclusion? Mikhail must have left in a hurry. Uh, we found uh, certain items of significance, including a briefcase containing um, documents uh, for the purchase of the vehicle, the owner's manual for that vehicle, 
and uh, some pictures of the deceased group, pictures including uh, friends. Also, investigators sensed McHale's new Acura was becoming important. But where was it? It wasn't found near the body, nor at the apartment. At that point, we don't have a car. We don't know where that car is, but the uh, deceased is now developing an identity, a personality, and we're, we're getting some idea of who he is. An easygoing guy, tidy, hardworking, who'd suddenly come into enough money to buy a brand new car. Detectives checked the local dealership. There, they found the salesman who sold Mikhail the car three weeks earlier. He told investigators he'd been surprised when Mikhail had paid for the car in one lump sum. He had picked it up Saturday, the same Saturday he had first shown the car to his friend, the last day he had been seen alive. But where was the car now? This kind of investigation is a classic whodunit. Every little piece of, of evidence can be referred to as a, as a small pebble. The investigator wants to find that pebble and put it in a pile. And he wants to get every pebble he can. He doesn't want to overlook anything because the bigger that pile gets, the stronger the case is. One of those pebbles would be the blowflies. Morning, Dr. Neil Haskell? Yes. Yeah. Package here for you, sir. Okay. First initial, last name. The All bugs right. had arrived in Indiana. The next move was to study them in his lab. From the specimens collected from the dead body, Haskell will try to identify the exact species of blowfly. There are over 90 different kinds. Once you you die, and you die in a in an in an environment that has accessibility to the blowflies, and the temperatures are high enough to support the activity of the blowflies, within a very short period of time, you're gonna have maggots. Well, first of all, you're gonna have the flies finding you, laying the eggs, and those eggs eventually hatching into maggots, and then uh, starting that, that whole process then of the decomposition. All of them proceed from egg to pupa to maggot, and finally to their metamorphosis as a fly. But each kind has a slightly different time frame for their life cycle. Since blowflies begin laying their eggs moments after death, it's possible to figure out when a person died, factoring in certain variables such as temperature. While blowflies have predictable life cycles, climate and temperatures can have a dramatic effect on the rate at which they develop on a corpse left in the open. That's why Haskell studies the bug activity on his pigs in different conditions. In the open sun, he finds lots of maggots. This particular pig uh, has been out uh, approximately two weeks, uh, about 14 days. And we see it's, it's considerably well cleared of the soft tissue, all a result of the maggots themselves. But in the adjacent wooded area, Haskell's pig carcasses are far less decomposed. The bugs are not nearly as active, even though these pigs have been left out for the same amount of time as those in the sun. We do have a definite difference in the temperatures then that would dry the growth envelopment of the uh, maggots that would be on this pig as opposed to the pig that had the thousands, tens of thousands of maggots in the open. As Haskell continued his scientific study of the case, investigators uncovered more about McHale's financial dealings. McHale's bank account had one entry for $40,000 US. They traced it back to a businessman in Florida who claimed it was a retainer for Mikhail to secure new Russian business contacts for him. Now detectives knew why Mikhail was going to Florida. But Florida was in the opposite direction from the woods where his dead body had been discovered. Detectives also located Mikhail's downstairs neighbor. She described the strange noises she had heard two Saturdays ago the Saturday, Mikhail was allegedly sleeping upstairs before heading off for Florida. She was asleep. Around 3 a.m., she heard a noise. Someone was breaking into her apartment. Her mind raced, trying to think of what she would do to defend herself. Then she heard footsteps going up the stairs next door. 
A few minutes later, she heard a scuffle, then a strange noise. By the time she looked out, there was no one there. But the back door, which was always kept closed, was wide open. It all sounded like a murder might have happened upstairs that Saturday night. But one person's account, one who was not an eyewitness, was not enough to nail a murderer. Who had broken into the apartment that night? Who had murdered Mikhail, and where was the car? Investigators had hit a brick wall. They decided to put a photo of the car on TV and seek the public's help. They were about to get their second big break. A shipping clerk called police saying she recognized the car as the one she had shipped to the Soviet city of St. Petersburg. So that was a very big break because that created a paper trail. And a, a break like that speeds up an investigation because we've now got a, a, a tangible route to follow, something we can hang our hat on, now we want to find this car. St. Petersburg had a thriving black market in cars. They were worth three or four times their value Plus, they didn't require registration. Though detectives still lacked any suspects, they now had a motive, greed. Then came the third big break. The detective showed the shipping clerk a picture of Mikhail to find out if he was the one who shipped the car. The clerk said she didn't recognize Mikhail, but she did point out and drop off. Bells went off at that point because that individual had already been interviewed by myself and my partner, Detective Arbor. That person did not mention to us, oh, by the way, I shipped the vehicle of the deceased to Russia. Um, big turning point in the investigation. But investigators hadn't nailed the case just yet. Another branch of forensics was about to enter the story. At the time of the autopsy, 11 tiny orange fibers had been found on Mikhail's body. One of the officers remembered having seen an orange carpet in one of the suspect's apartment. Investigators got a sample of that orange carpet and sent it to Joanne Ulmer at the Center for Forensic Sciences to compare it with the fibers found on Mikhail's corpse. On one side, you'll have the mounted fibers of your known sample. On the other side, you'll have the mounted unknown fiber or fibers. You then examine them under a split screen and compare the color and other morphological characteristics to see if they're similar to each other. These T-shaped cross-sectional fibers I had never seen before. In my 10 years here and the hundreds of cases I've done, I had never seen them. No one I knew here had ever seen them. And I had to conclude that the carpet fibers found on the deceased body were consistent with originating from the same source as the carpet from the suspect's apartment. Who was that suspect? Vladimir Yelman. When detectives questioned Yelman about why he hadn't mentioned anything about shipping Mikhail's car to Russia, Yelman claimed it was because he was afraid of getting Mikhail in trouble. Yelman insisted that Mikhail had asked him that Sunday to ship the car. And Dropoff later corroborated Yelman's story. Despite the accumulation of convincing circumstantial evidence, the Crown's case would rest on establishing an accurate time of death. Neil Haskell hadn't weighed in yet. Could his evidence disprove the suspect's story and nail Mikhail's killer? One of the most important aspects of doing forensic entomology is the assessment of the temperatures uh, from the specific habitat to the scene itself. Haskell obtained detailed data from a weather station near the site where Mikhail's body was found. He compared this to the temperature data he had had monitored at the actual site to see how different the two were. When everything was factored in, he concluded that Mikhail's body had been in the woods 11 days. Working backwards, it put the murder early Sunday morning, but Yelman and a drop-off insisted that late Sunday, Mikhail had asked him to ship his car to Russia. 
But the blowfly said Mikhail had already been dead by then. And blowflies don't lie. After all this information was gathered, this is what investigators believe happened that night. On the same Saturday that Mikhail had picked up his car, he told his friends about his plans to drive to Florida. He arrived home about 10 to get his stuff and maybe catch a little shut-eye. Whenever he woke up, he would start out for Florida. Around three in the morning, they broke into his place. Police surmised that Yellman, who had studied martial arts, dispensed with him quickly. They then lifted him out of bed, dumped him into the trunk of a car, and drove to a place in the middle of nowhere. They bought a new owner's manual. Remember, McHale's was left in his briefcase. Then they shipped the car to St. Petersburg. Yelman and Andropov were arrested. The fibers linked them to the body and the bugs helped eat away their alibi. Both men were tried and convicted of first degree murder and sentenced to life. This work has, uh, in this, this profession, as a forensic entomologist, uh, has to be the most exciting thing I have ever done in my life, and it's the most challenging. Uh, every day is like Christmas to me. I kid you not, I, I can be sitting in the, in, the, in the laboratory trying to finish up a case, um, the phone will ring, and I'm off on a new adventure. Is there a connection between the world of bugs and the human world? At our worst, do we feed on each other in the name of survival? Or is it really greed? Mikhail Slotnik was murdered by his friends and countrymen for a car. As Shakespeare said, like flies to wanton boys, we are to the gods, they kill us for their sport. So the next time you kill a fly, remember, you might be killing an expert witness. The stories on Exhibit A are based on actual cases. The names of the victims have been changed to protect their identities. 